Tonight on Reporting Scotland, modernise to survive. A review of the National Trust for Scotland says it must cut the number of trustees who govern it and find out exactly what it owns. Warnings over another so-called legal high after a rise in hospital admissions in the capital. Just because there's the word legal in the name of these, these compounds doesn't mean they're not, doesn't mean they're safe. They're still very strong and are producing really quite marked medical problems for these people. And also tonight, the Edinburgh military tattoo through the ages. Celebrating 60 years of the world's biggest military festival. And Andy Murray is preparing to defend his Rogers Cup title in Toronto, but who is he referring to here? A lot of class. And he's a very nice looking man as well. <laughs> uh, in person, so uh, no, it was uh, that was really cool to meet them. The National Trust for Scotland must undergo root and branch reform if it's to survive. That's the recommendation of a review into the troubled organisation by the former presiding officer of the Scottish Parliament, George Reid. He says the heritage body must cut the number of trustees who help govern it. His report also found the trust isn't exactly clear on what it owns. Our correspondent Jamie McIver is at a National Trust property for us tonight. Jamie. Well, Jackie, this is New Hales near Musselburgh. With its impressive architecture and manicured lawn, it's just one of the many treasures which the National Trust for Scotland takes care of. But the past few years have been difficult years for the Trust. Jobs have gone, buildings have been mothballed, and the Trust has even had to sell its headquarters in Edinburgh. And today came this, a radical blueprint for change. The National Trust for Scotland owns buildings, battlefields and even islands. But preserving the way the Trust is run isn't an option. There's set to be a cull in the number of people who govern it. Currently there are 87 trustees and 100 other non-executives. There's almost one non-executive for every four members of staff. You wouldn't like that in the BBC. Uh, contemporary usage, best charity practice, get the trustees down from 87 to 15. That allows a good skills mix, but it does allow, most importantly, strategic direction. The trust simply wasn't fit for purpose in the modern age. Incredibly, it had no single record of just what it owned, and it didn't know the cost of repairing and maintaining its estate. Hutchison's Hall in Glasgow hides behind the scaffolds. It was mothballed after a budget crisis at the trust last year. Jobs went too and campaigners are welcoming today's proposals for change. Cutting the number of trustees is a big move forward and the emphasis on conservation is absolutely correct. It's a conservation charity and it must find its place in the map of heritage uh, management in Scotland. Another change could see closer partnerships with other charities, businesses and public bodies like Historic Scotland. I feel very confident that all the things that we're working on at the moment, combined with the huge goodwill and support that we have from the whole of Scotland that we noticed last year, uh, that we will be able to uh, increase the amount of money that we can bring in from working in partnership with other people, that we can harness what we're doing uh, towards bringing about a lot of change in what we do, but at the same time attracting more visitors, engaging more people to come and enjoy our properties. The proposals for change will be discussed at the Trust's annual general meeting next month. And Jamie, what can you tell us about suggestions that, that more National Trust properties will have to be sold off to help balance the books? Well, Jackie, newspaper claims at the weekend that the Trust could have to sell off major properties were completely wide of the mark. But what we may see in the longer term is the Trust uh, continuing to look at some of the buildings in its portfolio, because as well as the castles and the historic treasures like this one, the Trust also takes care of a lot of more unremarkable properties, things like bungalows and buyers which it was left. And once there's been a full review of the Trust's portfolio, then it may look look at selling off some of the properties like that, which are of no significant historical or cultural importance. But there's absolutely no question of selling off any of the treasures. Jamie, thank you. There's been another warning over the dangers of so-called legal highs after doctors in Edinburgh reported a jump in hospital admissions within the last week. It's being linked to a substance called ivory tide, which is being marketed as bath salts. Stephen Godden reports. 
In the fast-moving world of legal highs, the names and packaging are ever-changing, but in the capital, they're at the centre of a trend as consistent as it is worrying. In the last week, around 20 people have been taken to hospital suffering serious symptoms, an out-of-the-ordinary rise that's causing doctors real concern. These are significant medical problems, and I think it's important people realise that just because there's the word legal in the name of these, these compounds doesn't mean they're not doesn't mean they're safe. They're still very strong and are producing really quite marked medical problems for these people. A possible link between the cases is a substance called Ivory Wave, sold as bath salts but used as a drug. We know fairly little so far. It appears to be relatively new in availability. Um, quite what is the active ingredient in any given packet of Ivory Wave is unclear and whether it's the same in each packet and whether it's the same strength in each packet is far from clear as well. Until recently, Ivory Wave was available in so-called head shops, but today, in this store, we were told they no longer stock it. On the internet, there are no such problems for those looking to get hold of legal highs. The very latest are available at the touch of a button, removing the need for any illegal backstreet dealing. Drug charities believe that's part of the appeal. For them, the shifting nature of the legal high market is a big problem. With legal highs, these research chemicals have not been around for very long, they've not been tested by many people, so we have a very limited bank of knowledge. And as we develop more information on it, when these substances get banned, we're back to square one, you know, as a new substance emerges. The government are looking to introduce a faster system of temporary bans by next autumn. In the meantime, those thinking about taking legal highs are being warned to consider the risks. Stephen Godden reporting Scotland, Edinburgh. You're watching Reporting Scotland from the BBC. Still to come before 7 o'clock. Scots' help for the victims of the Pakistani floods is praised, but organisers of the appeal urge people to keep on giving. Just how much does this lady weigh? Find out how park rangers in the Highlands enticed her onto the scales. In sport, Scotland sent a depleted squad to Sweden. We'll hear the latest from the camp and the last warm-up before the European Championship qualifiers. And back in Canada to defend his title, Andy Murray is still on the lookout for a new coach. With the floods in Pakistan now affecting more people than the Asian tsunami disaster of 2004, organisers of a charity appeal are urging Scots to keep on giving. One senior aid worker who's just returned from the country says there's now a race against time to get help to the millions of people at risk. Fiona Walker reports. A reminder that the holy month of Ramadan is about to begin, and that means fasting from dawn to dusk. But here in Pakistan, many people are already hungry, as well as homeless and without clean water. These people, they have lost their homes, they have lost their livelihood. This is what the Scottish head of Islamic Relief has been seeing for himself in the worst hit areas of Pakistan. It was very difficult for myself to see children in pain and women desperately needing food for their children, especially milk for the young babies. I seen children in hundreds and hundreds drinking water from the, that contaminated water and constantly rubbing their arms and, and body because they are, they've got a nasty rash. Each time we hear more news from Pakistan, the numbers affected increase not by thousands, but by millions. Today we're being assured the money raised by Scots so far is already making a difference to them. Aid is getting through. We have received well over £500,000 from Scottish people alone already, which is fantastic. Um, what that is providing on the ground at the moment is very basic emergency provisions, so tents, blankets, um, uh, chlorine tablets to make the water drinkable, um, very basic provisions. Donations have been coming in from all sections of society, but the Pakistani community have a particularly strong and sometimes personal connection with those affected by this disaster. Here at Glasgow Central Mosque, they've raised £12,000 at last Friday prayers alone. And during the month of Ramadan, where there's a duty to give to charity, they expect that support to go up substantially. We might not know their faces or their circumstances, but Scots are being asked to remember their donations are helping many more people like them. In fact, already the number affected is more than double the population of Scotland. Fiona Walker, 
reporting Scotland, Glasgow. It was established in the aftermath of the Second World War as a celebration of the Army's role in Scottish life. Well, now the tattoo is 60 years old. For the next three weeks, performers from here and afar will entertain sold-out crowds in a grand birthday bash. Well, our reporter Lisa Summers is on the famous Esplanade for us tonight. Lisa. Jackie, in less than an hour, the gates will open and this place will be filling up with people waiting to see tonight's performance of the tattoo. But when it's empty like this, you do get a real sense of just how big a production it is to put on. It's taken six months to construct the grandstand with room for eight and a half thousand people. But go back to 1950 when the very first tattoo took place here. Then there were just a few benches and standing room for the rest of the cloud. And there were only eight acts. Tonight, they can expect a lot more. Last pipes and drums in the centre. Quick march! It's the biggest military event of its kind in the world, and this year the tattoo turns 60. It was created in 1950 as the Scottish Army's contribution to the Edinburgh Festival. Since then, it's brought crowds to the Castle Esplanade from near and far. Muriel Laidlaw was 16 when she went to that first tattoo. We were all so excited, wondering what we were going to see. We had no idea then what it was going to be like. And although the format's not changed much, Muriel's never missed one since. Now it's watched by millions worldwide. It's important to remember that uh, 60 years ago it was designed along with the International Festival to cheer people's spirits up. And, you know, people ask me, well, what's the uh, recipe for success? And I say, well, if whatever is on that esplanade is either pulling people's heartstrings or making them tap their feet, then it's doing the right thing. Just like the audience, performers have come from all over the world to take part in this year's Diamond Jubilee celebrations. This is the Jordanian Military Armed Forces Band, and on the night of celebration, they're having some fun. As are the New Zealand Army Band. Entertainment is always diverse, but at its heart, as always, the pipes and drums. The bagpipes mean everything to Scotland, and they mean everything to the military in Scotland, because the guys need a sense of identity, and whether they're at home or abroad, when they hear the sound of the pipes, that just lifts them and reminds them that the job that they're doing is important for their, their national pride, and it's important for everybody back home that they serve. For the next three weeks, the tattoo will be celebrating its 60th birthday in style. Well, if that did make you want to see more, unfortunately, the tattoo is sold out. In fact, it's sold out for the last 11 years, but there'll be much more on 60 years of the tattoo and a BBC documentary to be screened later in the year. Jackie. Lisa, thanks for that. Enjoy. Now, some of the other stories across Scotland this Monday. <laughs> 